Hey, Masters, we are here with Mr. Jay Malik today. Jay, what's going on, man? Oh, man, just surviving the pandemic. <laughs> yes, yeah. It's uh, hopefully we'll be we're seeing a, a light at the end of the tunnel, right? We're in January, so yeah. It uh, seems like things are loosening up, but um, good to hear, you, good to see you again. I should say, and hear you, right? Because uh, uh, we tried to do this, I think, December, and we had some tech issues. So it seems like that's figured out today, at least so far, which is good. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. Well, think you know a little bit about you. Uh, your American spiritual teacher and author who helps high performance individuals, public fig figures, influencers, and entrepreneurs unlock their dormant potential by utilizing the spirit of success. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny. Last time I remember I asked you, what is a spiritual teacher? So let's, uh, let's start there, man. Um, I mean, spiritual teaching is just, my life is ruled by spirituality as the universe is we're bound by laws and, and mathematical formulas. And those things can be used to enrich our lives and our minds, our emotions, our spiritual states. And so I just mm -hmm. teach people the concepts, the formulas to help them through situations, whether it's in business, love, family, et cetera. So I take pride in that. And how did you, uh, I mean, you, looking at you, I'm, I, I don't know, I don't know how old you, I'm going to guess like 32, maybe 29. Okay, cool. So yeah. So and when did you uh, when did you become aware of this? And how did you know this was your calling? Ah, uh, man, that's a crazy question. Um, actually, the night before September 11th, I was um, nine. Or was I 10? Do the math. I was 10 years old. September, um, yeah, 2001. And I right? had a just a very overwhelming spiritual experience, like very, very intense. I didn't know what it meant at the time, but I knew what was going on, but I wasn't sure why or what it was directing me towards. And I took a lot of time in my later teens, like between 15, 16, probably up until um, 20, just studying virtually every religion on the planet and uh, philosophy and just different things. And it's weird how it, how it, how I'm at this point now, you know, it's kind of like seeing your life flash before your eyes kind of thing. But um, I've always known there's a spiritual purpose in my life and teaching people and seeing people lives be enriched and also looking at it from a societal standpoint is what I'm most passionate about. So most things I teach, for the individual is for the collective growth. So I talk about family. It's not just about family, it's about community and then society. So we practice these mm -hmm. spiritual principles. It expands us out so much further. So it's just a, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm still even getting in rhythm of everything, right? Like I don't even feel like I have it figured out. It's just, I'm just letting it flow. And it's it's been working out for me, so. Well, hey, good for you. I, I know you've got uh, multiple books. Uh, I looked at your your website. It's impressive. Uh, you know, you get some some nice uh, collateral, some products. That's great. Uh, you know, it's funny when I when the reason I asked you the question is because like you, obviously you uh, you know you look you're even younger than uh, than I thought, which is which is great. Most times when you think of like spiritual you know teachers or gurus, you're thinking like some some guy that's been around for 90 years or, you know what I mean? So, uh, but you've been doing this for 20 years, right? You said it's when you were nine, it started. So, you know, so what, um, so something you said, you saw your life kind of flash before you, what, what did you mean by that? I don't, I, maybe I missed something. I mean, so in my teens and my early twenties, and I was just reading and researching so many different things. It's almost like, as if I saw myself, as if I had written some of these things. Like I, I was resonating at a level where it's like, how do I know this already? Kind of thing. And I mean, from Eastern philosophy, um, traditional African spirituality to Native American spirituality, European spirituality, like Aboriginal spirit, it, like I'm just connecting dots. And I'm like, 
something in me felt like I, I, like, was I here writing this before? And so it's just an interesting experience. I can't really explain it. Like it's, it's mysticism is, you know, one of the arts of spirituality that, that feeling like life is just flowing through you. And I think everyone can get to that, you know, mm. state of where life is flowing through you versus you trying to figure life out. Just let things flow. And that's how it feels sometimes. Like, have I been here before? Did I do this already? Like, mm. so but I think spirit also is transformed. I think when nothing dies, right? It's just physics. Nothing dies, just changes form. And some of the things, the thoughts, the ideas, expression that are here now are just, they were carried down from thousands of years ago. And sometimes I think we recapture that energy. It's like, wait, it's like deja vu a little bit. But I think everybody's probably experienced that at least once or twice in their life was like, was I here before? Mm -hmm. Was I doing this already? You know? Yeah. That's a wild, that's a wild uh, feeling because it happens. Yeah. I, I, it's probably happened to me a dozen times in my life. I mean, I'm, I just turned 50. So uh, it's, yeah, it, it certainly makes you think, but you, you can't, it, you can't connect it. I, at least I can't, I can't connect it to, to anything except it, it does kind of say, okay, maybe there is something else or maybe there was something else. It's, it's, it's wild. Um, let me ask you this. So is, so you said life, something you mentioned was life flowing through you as opposed to uh, trying to figure out what was it or um, trying, to figure life out. trying to figure life out. Yeah. Um, what, is there any, do you have an example of that? So one of the big concepts of like spirituality, like you can talk yin yang, masculine, feminine, um, free flowing, rigid, whatever terminology you want to use, but we have the ego and we have the body, right? So we have the mind, which is its own thing. It's not connected to the body at all. We have a brain and then we have a mind. And I think it's very important to establish mm. the different things. Like people are like, oh, I'm thinking this. It's like, are you thinking that or is your mind thinking that? And so once we figure out we have a mind and a brain, we can kind of start differentiating between what's happening when, and the mind is kind of that, you know, it's this, our collective experiences that, that we're observing life through, but your spiritual, even your body, right? Like your body, your actual brain matter, your bones, your skin, they're made of things from this uniform, this universe, this, this physical existence your body is actually made of the same thing that the earth is made of, right? And so there's something about those things being alive that I won't say life is 100% predestined, but there is something about spirit knowing how to navigate the exact time and place that you're in at all times. And when we let that mind kind of be open versus being a expression life just flows through and we get to kind of observe it through the mind versus letting the mind dictate where we go and mm. when we try to figure that out we get confused because it's like we haven't been here before the mind hasn't right but the body has the body is made up of things that have been here for millions of years so it knows how to navigate this place but the mind doesn't we have to just split those two things up like my mind and my body are not the same mm. That's pretty deep, man. <laughs> I like it. Um, so let me, let me ask, let me figure out how to ask. You. So when you think, when you talk about the mind and the, in the, in the brain being different, I'm a little bit, and you said the mind and the body is obviously as well, but uh, I, you know, I like to think of that as, as what I, I call it. The, I make mean, the little voice. I refer to it all the time in training is the little voice. That's always there. Even as we're having this conversation, there's always like this little, voice like what what question should i ask next and is this a good question you know it's just right so how do you how is it i don't even know it's, it's not possible to separate the two i think you just have to, and that's my opinion you maybe you have a different opinion i think it's just kind of getting in alignment and yep. mm. you know and just kind of being like all right that makes sense that doesn't make sense you know what i mean is that is there another way to deal with that or or it's not even something you need to deal with. It just is, right? Exactly. You know, we don't deal with it. It's because mm. dealing with it means there's something wrong. But when we just accept that it's there, 
but it's really there to just collect exper- experiences, right? It's like we're riding a roller coaster. We're just on this human roller coaster ride for however long we're here. Maybe it's a hundred years, maybe it's 30 years, whatever it is, we, we pick the ride, we put in the coins and now we go through the journey and the mind has never been here. So it's like, Ooh, what's that? What's that? Let me touch this. Let me touch that. Let me, let me talk to this person, that person. And then it's really just supposed to enjoy it. Like enjoy the ride. Like life happens whether you want to or not. I always use the, it's this um, phrase, but you have to think about not breathing. Right. Like your body breathes without you consciously thinking about it because there's something holding you alive. Like you're not consciously thinking like let me inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, heartbeat, heartbeat, blood flow, blood flow. Like your body's doing its own thing. The mind is the only thing here to observe what's happening. So you're on your own roller coaster, right? Like your body is a roller coaster. It is the actual, you know, the, the container that you get in when you ride the ride in life whatever places we go, it's just to ride, then you just enjoy it. No matter where we are, we just. Mm. I love it. You know, I, uh, man, someone, a mentor said to me years ago, um, and this kind of, that what you just said reminded me of that is, um, oh God, how did he say it? He said, your body is, um, oh gosh. Essentially he said that similar to as you is like your body is, is your, is your vessel and you got to take mm. care of it or something like, like you, if you don't take, well, I think he said, it, if you don't take care of your body, where are you going to live? Right. Something mm. along those lines, like, you know, so it really does. It's cause yeah, too many people, I think, you know, I think maybe for someone listening to this conversation, like how you, how do, how do we bring, so, so we got a bunch of salespeople that are going to mm. be listening to this conversation for the most part. How, what, how can they use this, uh, Jay in, 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 on their journey. I mean, I love sales. Um, sales is life really, you know, we go through life and it's persuasion and it's, you know, there's an art form to it. Um, I think when we're in a sales process and you think about is my mind in it, you know, there's a person on the other side. Like this is, I think what the power is of using this. There's a person on the other side who probably doesn't know this and their mind is probably going. So you, you, you ask for the sale, there's objection, but it's just like a response. Like they're not even really mm. consciously thinking about what you even said. You can't have the perfect product, perfect price, perfect offer, whatever it is. And they're like, no, I'm, I, I can't do it right now. I gotta ask my wife. Or I gotta, I gotta go talk to, they're going to make something up because it's just a response. Cause they're in the, their mind has clouded mm. their, their brain. And so like, if you understand that people are very, very foggy, sales is just creating clarity. You know, people are really big on the certainty thing. Like you have to be certain of something, but you can't be certain until you're clear. And I think a big problem in like marketing and sales today is like, sometimes the things just aren't clear. It's just like the value isn't clear. What do we, what is the tangible deliverable? What is not, it's just not clear. So, if you make that clarity first, let that, that mind becomes at ease because it's like, oh, okay, I've, maybe, I've, maybe I've been here before. Maybe I did buy this already. And another part of that is, you know, your imagination as a salesperson, I don't know if anybody does like visualizations, like role playing is the same thing as like visualizing, right? Like you're reenacting the moment you're ready to handle the objection. But if, if I can already imagine Okay, I know, I know where, I know where you are right now. You're, you're. This is, this is their problem. I can imagine me unlocking the key to that problem in their head to make this clear for them. It's just mm. you're really like playing almost not mind control, but you're unlocking things. Like, okay, they have a problem here because they don't see this. Like, if they saw this, I know they will buy this because they got the problem. Here's the solution. They just got to do it. But why are they not doing it? And it's like those objections are just the mind. Okay, let me let me clean off your windshield for you, so you can see it clearly. So when you now you're clear, then we can talk about certainty, and that's enthusiasm. Mm. But if you're as a salesperson, you got to be clear. Some salespeople are selling stuff they're not clear on. They're like, I don't even know what the value of this is. Like, I'm just trying to get my commission. But like, get clear on somebody got mm. that problem. This is a solution. 
I'm very, very clear on the solution. So I, I'm getting on the phone with you like, yo, I know you need this. And now it's a, it's a battle of the sale. It's the, they're going to sell you on they're not ready. Or you're going to sell them on they got to do this. And if you're that convinced that your product or service is great and they need it and you're clear, they're going to feel your clarity, clarity more than your certainty. Because some people, you can push, push, push. And some people are really good at like aggressive persuasion. Not everybody's that good at that. That takes a lot of art and you got to have a certain kind of personality and bravado to do that. But everybody can get clear. Every single salesperson can get clear. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's uh, interesting because I, I, I've been in sales for 34, going on 35 years. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, I think the first step, you know, for anybody listening to this is, you know, a good friend of mine, Vlad Katz, uh, recently, I spent my last two years in the real estate world recruiting real estate agents and recruited um, almost just under just I maybe, maybe it was 200 a little maybe a little under or a little over 200 agents in two years into a, a Keller Williams into a bunch of Keller Williams offices and um, one thing that and Vlad said to me after after that is I'm in, I'm in business with these guys now as he says the first step um, to an agent moving is they have to make a commitment first to leave where they're at. Mm. And nobody ever said that to me before. And it was such mm. clarity. Mm. Like it's because if they, if they're not going to make that commitment first, then we're just, I'm just wasting my time, you know? So I think that's one of the challenges with sales and even in, in that area is you'll be talking to people and, you know, maybe they're curious or maybe they're just, whatever just going along with you to be polite but they really have no interest in doing anything so is that the clarity you're talking like once somebody's made up a mind okay i'm gonna i need to do something like i know now i got this phone this this iphone 10 there's a new one out now 12 and i know the phone companies what they do is they you know now there's like 5g this one doesn't have 5g anymore so now all of a sudden it's not working the right way so my wife and I are going to go have to go upgrade our, like, I know I have to do that. So when I go in the phone store today, there's not much selling going on. Exactly. And right? that, I'm going, yeah, I'm going, I'm up. Yeah. You're pre-sold almost. Like, yeah. Like, but like motivation, I mean, tell me what you think. Cause if, if you're your salesperson, you're selling something, you can't necessarily motivate someone, but I think you can inform someone enough to see their, see what's holding them back. Mm. You know, like they have to get motivated by seeing it, but it's like, it's like telling someone, hey, you know, if you eat that, you're going to die 20 years earlier. Here's why. Versus saying, like, you need to eat this new nutritious thing. It's like, like I said, you have to let them know that where you are is not, the, not a good place. Here's why. And then here's why you can get here as well. And it doesn't have to be aggressive. I'm not a very aggressive you know, salesperson, I'm talking to people, it's just, let's get clear on this. That, that makes sense. Let's be clear on this and that makes sense. So the problem makes sense, solution makes sense. They seem like it makes sense. And it's just, okay. So, so I'm gonna switch gears then because what we're talking about right now brings us perfectly into your point of the biggest challenges you'll help our listeners overcome. And you know, it's, it is because what you, what you said is brilliant in the fact that I can talk to someone and I can share, okay, here are some, some, you know, reasons or some examples of why this may be better for you, but yet they still may be closed off. Right. So it, in my opinion is it's, it's a comfortability thing, right? So you, you had said, um, you know, uh, getting to comfortable self doubt, fear of success, uh, getting too comfortable that's is that so why is that so common because we live in the comfort place like the, the the body the brain is is wants to conserve energy and i think that just rubs off into like culture and especially in sales culture where it's you know it's a lot of numbers and metrics it's a lot of rejection a lot of no's I mean, you don't need a lot of yeses to you know be very successful in sales but it's can you motivate a customer if you're not motivated? Right, like it's it's in, it's impossible. So you're you're going to be stagnant because you can't 
you don't even resonate with the energy of going above and beyond, or you don't, you don't resonate with the energy of motivation because you're not motivated. How can you motivate the, the buyer if the seller isn't motivated? Or if the seller's not clear, how can the buyer be clear? And a lot of salespeople like look at your life, not just, not just your sales career, but look at your personal life, your fitness life, your spiritual life, your emotional life, your mental life. What are you leaving on the table every day? There's some, what are you leaving? What kind of potential for today did you leave out? That you, you never get that day back, but you didn't put 100% in today or 110% mm. if you're going above and beyond. You're, you're putting in 50% here. You put in 30% in family. You put in 20% in nutrition. You put in 70% in sales. So everywhere you're kind of just like mediocre. And then you get a buyer on the phone and they're unsure. They may be living a mediocre life. They need someone to give them an example of what it means to live 110% which is a salesperson job. I know you got a problem, man. Here's a solution. Like, let's, let's do this. What do you, what's the problem? And that makes them so clear. Like, yo, that makes sense. This guy makes sense. It's, it's simple, but you have to be living it. And I think a lot of salespeople don't actually mm. live, right? They just, they yeah. live 50% in every single department and it rubs off on the, in the, in the numbers. Yeah. And, and I think something else you said before was, um, you know, we, they need to be really clear on, on, um, on the value prop. Like how does, how does um, my product, my service, whatever, my widget, whatever, imp- help you improve your life, get you from where you are to, to where you want to go. And then I think that, that you're right. I think there's a, there's a lack of, of clarity. Uh, we see that a lot unfortunately, you know? Um, yeah. So, so talk about, um, uh, fear of success. That's a really interesting one. I, I, that's in my book. I have a couple, not just a couple paragraphs, not a whole chapter on it, but, um, I, I love to hear more about that and learn more about. So when you, when you think fear of success, what does that mean to you? I think first thing is emotional, emotional, like, how will other people perceive me if I acquire more resources? They're going to be envy. They're going to be um, jealousy. They're going to be um, me having to overextend myself. Am I going to be able to handle it? Maybe I had, I've had bad money problems in the past. So if I have more money, they will just have worse problems. Um, self-worth is a big part of it. Like the fear of success, like, am I really worthy? Like, am I worthy mm-hmm. of being the top sales guy or the top sales woman? Am I worthy of that? And it sound, may sound crazy to some people, but if you think you deserve to be number one, you'd be number one. You know, like Michael Jordan didn't think he was supposed to be number two. Mm. LeBron James does not think he's supposed to be number two. I use, the, I use sports as, all the time as an analogy of yeah, life. I love sports. NBA players, right? These are the best 400 basketball players in the entire world. What's the difference between the number one guy and the number 400 guy? Because these are all millionaires. They've all beaten out high school and collegiate athletes. They are top level guys. They've trained, they've done the conditioning. What makes number 400 comfortable, right? And a lot of, of, of this sales guys, sales women as well will, can resonate with this because we will all criticize the guy who's underperforming in sports. We we'll all talk about the person who doesn't live up to their potential in sports. Like, oh, he could have been a great player, but he didn't put all the effort in. But that, that I'll give you something I do in, in my life. So I love sports because I'll, I'll play out my life sometimes objectively, like as if a sports commentator was watching my life and life was the sport. Like, oh, Jay's doing the podcast today. I hope he's ready. What is this? If someone was commentating your life, following you around, you didn't know it. The cameras were on all the time. What would they say about your life? What would they say about your potential? What would they say about where you're not putting the training in? Where you're not putting the effort in? Those things come down like, are you afraid of what you can become? Are you afraid of your potential? Mm. Are you really putting in the work to be the best? And if not, why not? And that's like a very deep emotional thing people don't realize they have. It's like, I could be better than what I am, but I'm not going to be. Why not? What is that barrier there? Like, you know, you can be better. You know, for a fact, everyone, every single human on the planet knows I can be a little bit better tomorrow than I was today. But most people, 
either live the exact same life or they regress. Mm. What is it? What is it about that? Especially for, in sales, like you got to get better, but I'm afraid so, something in me is afraid. Maybe it's my culture, maybe it's my background, maybe it's how I grew up, maybe it's my mom talking, my dad taught me, whatever it is. But the same thing with the NBA player who's on the bench, and we're like, oh, he don't, he don't, he don't even play the game right. We can say the same thing about ourselves. Are we playing the game right? Are we playing the game at the highest level? Are we trying to be number one, number two, number three? Are we cool with just being in the game? Well, I, I got a jersey. I'm cool. Being, I have a jersey. I get paid. I got a jersey. That's fine mm. with me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the difference between, um, you know, although some people would, would say, like, did you happen to watch the, um, the Tiger Woods documentary? It's really good, actually. Check that I, out. I, it's yeah, I would definitely check it out. But I think Tiger, similar to Jordan, I didn't know him and Jordan even hung out, but him, Jordan Barkley, I guess, spent a lot of time together. Um, very similar mindset, though. For them, it was all about being the best, mm -hmm. the best. And, and uh, it's just it's it's a different, uh, just a different mindset, a different level of commitment, um, sacrifice. And, you know, in, in part of that, if you watch a documentary for people that have, you know, at the end, it, it has a happy ending because although, you know, he was a dominant player, he was not a happy person. He wasn't a fulfilled person. Um, he got in trouble. And then at the end, he, he just seemed like he was a happier person. He was actually having fun, but he was still winning where I don't know if a lot of people could have gone through that, that transformation, mm -hmm. right? Um, similar, similar to Jordan too, right? I mean, if you watched the Jordan, um, I, I forget the name of it, but that was phenomenal too. Yeah. yeah. What was it? The the whole uh, yeah. series. What was it? Yeah. The Last Dance. Yes, The Last Dance. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, everybody should watch that. That was now. Those were my times too. I grew up with Jordan and Pippen and you know Worthy and all those guys, you know, and uh, Reggie Miller on the Indiana yeah. Pacers. That was, those were my back in the day. That, that was my era of basketball, but. Yeah, I mean, you know, but we don't think of Jordan that way. You just think the guy's a machine. But I mean, there was there was another side to him, you know. Yeah. Um, what would you say is uh, so? This is a challenge and one for a lot of people. For me too, uh, the difference between fear of failure or fear of success. Could you can you put words to that or fear of failure? Fear of failure versus fear of success. Because they're so similar, right? It's hard to they're very, they're differentiate. Very, like a yin and yang thing. I think fear of success is if I actually go through with it and, it and it's successful, will I be able to handle success? Where failure is more about safety, right? Like success, fear is uncertainty. But failure is, and I'm more safe staying where I am than potentially messing something up and not being able to live with the consequence of me messing it up. So I'd rather just, I'd rather not go for number one and go for number 30 and just be cool with number 30. And I feel like I'm keeping right where I am. This it's, 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 it's mm. is fine here. This is good. Whereas fear of success is like, I ain't even thinking about failure right now. I'm just thinking about, cause I don't even deserve, it's like, it's not even in the playing field. When you think about the fear of success, it's like, I don't even want to think about success. I think you have to get past the fear of failure to really get to fear of success. Mm, I like that. Yeah, I'm still in that right away. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, man, so let's, so kind of, we'll, set, we'll start wrapping up. Um, you know, uh, question, I always ask for a question. The question you sent was, how does one begin to make a shift in their life? So why don't we answer that question? Yeah, I mean, first thing is, if you can imagine things being better, that's the first step. Can I imagine it being better? And then you'll see, you, it's instant. It's not even, it's not a long drawn out thing. Everyone knows there's something, there's always an elephant in the room. Everyone listening, myself included, has an elephant in the room. It's like, let me take care of that thing and then I'll be able to move a little bit further. It's like, let me take care of that. Let me imagine that reality with that elephant taken care of. And let me take care of it. Let me figure out how I need to navigate. And then I'll get the next elephant. Because there's always elephants in the room. It's like a, it's a room full of elephants for some reason. But we only can see one at a time. And that one is stopping us from moving forward. It's not about being perfect. It's just about improving. 
mm-hmm. on the roller coaster. And I think that process continually, you know, you don't get obsessed with, oh, I'm not perfect yet. It's just, it's just a process. You know, you go to the gym, lift weights. You don't say, oh, I'm, I'm not benching 320 yet. It's no, I'm just working out. I'll get to the next level when I get to the next level and let me enjoy this, but let me move forward at least while I'm here. I'm, I'm in this space. I might as well move forward. Do you, but so let's go back to the sports and that metaphor. Then and if you look at like a Jordan or a tiger, I don't know that they live in that, that space. Uh, their, their, their space is the space of, yeah, I got to get better. I got to get to 320 pounds. I got to be the number one. Or I got, you know what I mean? But and, I think and, they were also, they're freaks too. I think there are some people, there's like 1% of people who are probably listening who are like super freaks. They're always like, I'm a hyper, I'm competitive with myself. I'll, one of my favorite quotes of myself is, don't be better than anyone else. Try to be better than your best self. Like if you can imagine your best self, can mm. you go toe to toe with yourself? That's a very, it does something crazy to your psyche. Like, can I beat my best self? I can be my best self. Like, and it's like, pushes you forward but that's a little crazy thinking but i also think sometimes we can over index certain success areas which is why i said someone can be very high on sales but very low on family and maybe someone who's the buyer's calling in and they really got a family issue but the person can't really resonate with it because they got family issues they haven't went over above and beyond in that avenue so it's like we want to have holistically successful lives, not just business and financial, but emotional, mm. mental and social as well. And I think when we start over indexing, we start losing opportunity for the other areas. So how can I be a better brother, son, husband? Um, how can I be a better friend? How can I, you know, improve my community? How can I be a better emotional, stable being? How can I improve my spiritual life? How, and when you start doing those things, the business stuff is easy. This that's just like black and white. Again, it's the problem solution. It's it's not complicated. It's not rocket science. But we bring all the other areas of life that are complicated into business, and then try to figure out why is this business thing? These sales. I'm on a I'm on a slump right now. It's like no, you're not on a mm. sales slump. You're on a life slump. You just haven't zoomed out enough to look at how is your social, how is your sleep life. How's your nutrition? How's your fitness? How's your how's your wife? How's your husband? How are your kids? What's stressing you out? How can you take care of the elephant in the room? How can you allocate more resources to that to where you come in here? It's a clearer space. And I think that's very, very huge for people who are motivated, ambitious individuals because they're already you're already going above and beyond, but it's usually in one area of focus, right? Like it's usually this is my thing I'm good at. Everything else, forget it. It'll, it'll, it'll take care of itself but it doesn't take care of itself like you want to get better as a husband you have to get better as a husband you have to put the same work in as you would in your business or in your sales career in your social life it all takes work and the beauty of it is we all have a capacity to expand infinitely like there is a version of you that is perfect Mm. can you get there it's like life's little game we probably won't get ever get there and we don't have to get there because people we we exchange love. We understand the complexity of life. We understand there's problems, there's downsides, there's traumas, there's hurts, there's pains. But if I think the energy, it's more of the spirit of I, I want to be better. I can't be perfect for you, but I want to be better for you and be better for myself. That takes makes everything just simpler. Mm. So you know, I've been I, as I as I do these interviews. I'm always kind of listening and thinking of a title, you know, and I think um, be the best version of yourself is uh, might be a, what do you think for this, for this I'm one? Pretty good. I like that. I like that. You like it. Can we do better? What else? What can we do better than that? <laughs> can we do better? Yeah. Can we get better is the question, right? Cause we want, we want compelling, like we need compelling titles. So people, We'll see it and be like, all right, yeah, I want, I want to know that. I, I kind of like it, but what are your thoughts? Hmm. I mean, I almost like the question too. Can we do better? Can we be can better? We, that may can be, we be better. That may be enticing. Or um, can we be better? Can can we be? Okay, can we be better? Is better enough? I don't know. Maybe I don't know. I got to think about those. I mean, I like the question. Um. 
it resonates with you and I. I don't know if it's going to resonate with everybody, though, right? Because the FBO and algorithm. Huh? With the algorithm. Yeah. No. Can we be a better version of ourselves? I don't know. Well, I'll play around with it, man. Either way, it's going to be perfect, right? How do, how do our listeners get in touch with you? Um, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. If you search J Malik, actually just search the hashtag J Malik taught me and you'll see my content. You'll find my page easy on both Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. I'm um, also on YouTube, but you find me on Facebook and, and Instagram, you'll find me everywhere else. And my website is jmaliteachings.com and I have books, resources, um, blog posts. So, you know, I'm a wealth of information and just try to help. Awesome, man. Are you on Crazy Clubhouse yet? I'm you not. You Clubhouse? <laughs> I've heard about it. Heard Do you have an it. iPhone or no? I don't have an iPhone. Yeah, there you go. Well, you'll be on there soon, man. It's an, it's addicting. It's uh, it's <laughs> actually it's actually not bad, but it's like anything else. I I think you can, we can easily overdo it. So uh, yeah. But when you get on there, make sure you look me up quick so we can connect. And uh, I'd like to do this again. I'd like to talk to you about balance mm. because I think uh, you know we've hit you hit on that a few times in here, and um, you know uh, I think it would make another episode on, on yeah. that topic. You know. So, all right, my friend. Well, hey, appreciate you. Anything I didn't ask that uh, I should have asked or? You look perfect. You got it. All right, my friend. Awesome. Well, thank you again. I appreciate your time. Have a good one. All right, you too.